The story all you know, you know it, alhamdulillah, as he went on, he started thinking about the king and life and death. And he said, oh my Lord, show me how you give life and how you give death. Show me how you give life after death. Allah says, Do you not already have faith, O Ibrahim? He says, I already have faith in you, my Lord. I know that you give life and death. So that my heart can be certain. Now, a lot of people misunderstand that. What does it mean that his heart be certain? Your heart can be asking for certainty when you doubt something. Or you can ask for certainty when you want to have grounds to use when you teach others. So, evidence. There is a difference between when you are certain about something and you believe it. But when you're going to teach other people, you need, you need substance. How do you teach other people? You need to be grounded with arguments. And the prophets, Allah used to give them the strongest of arguments by letting them see things. They saw the angels, they saw miracles. And Ibrahim salam said, Ya Rabbi, since I'm your prophet, I would like to see it with my own eyes. So that when I talk, I talk through absolute certainty in what I am saying, meaning that I can back myself up and not give up. So I know, you know, the more knowledge you have, the more understanding you have, the more you see, the more you have a stronger argument. And there is a difference between believing and seeing. And we believe in what Allah said about the hereafter without seeing, and those who do that deserve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's rewards. The Prophet ﷺ said when he was about to die, he said, I'm going to miss seeing my brothers. And they said, who are your brothers, Ya Rasulullah? Aren't we here in front of you? He said, you are my companions. My brethren are the ones that I miss who are going to come later on. They believed in me and never saw me. They believed in me and never saw me. We ask Allah that we are one of them. So Ibrahim salam, then the story goes on that Allah told him to get some birds of different species, different types. And then he cut them up and killed them into many pieces and mixed them up and put a little bit on each mountain, four different hills. And then Allah said to him, Ud'uhunna, call them to you, Ya'tina kasaya, they will come to you walking and towards you. And this is also an indication of Hajj. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, وَأَذِّمْ فِي النَّاسِ بِالْحَجِّ يَأْتُوكَ رِجَالًا وَمِنْ كُلِّ ضَامِرٍ يَأْتُونَ يَأْتُوكَ مِنْ كُلِّ فَجٍ عَمِيقٍ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, call upon the people in Hajj to Ibrahim alayhi salam. And you will see all the people coming from all parts of the world and all hills and all valleys coming towards the Kaaba and Mecca. And this has happened for 5,000 years. And so he saw the birds coming to him and all the bits and pieces got together by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he saw them fly right in front of him. Brothers and sisters, these are miracles that Allah showed the prophets. We don't need to see. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, look at how an earth is dead and how it brings water to it and it comes to life. Look at how you were nothing before. Weren't you and I nothing before? Yani nothing in the sense that we weren't humans. We were nothing to be mentioned. What were we? And then things came together and you are born. When you were non-existent. Allah says the same way as Allah gave you life, He will bring you back to life again. So anyway, brothers and sisters, Ibrahim salam moves on and so many tragedies happen in his life. He then asks for a son, a child. He says, I, I, I seek a son. Why a son? Because a son is going to be able to carry the message as a prophet or as a righteous man and not fear that people uh, will abuse them because a woman can be vulnerable. So he wanted a son to carry the message on with strength. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives him, he's asking for this when he was only in his early 20s, when he's first married. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives him his first son Ismail when Ibrahim alayhi salam was, you know what? The tafsir says he was in old age, about 80, 85 years old. The Bible says that. But in the Quran, uh, Ibrahim alayhi salam says, Alhamdulillahi alladhi wahaba li ala al-kibari Ismail. Praise be to Allah who gave me in old age Ismail. So it means that he was very old. And he wasn't able to have children uh, in an old age. Uh, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him children in old age. But anyway, it doesn't mean that all old people can't have children, but he wasn't able to uh, all his life. So when he was 80, 85 or so, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him his first son, Ismail. And later on, he gave him a second son named Ishaq, even while his wife Sarah, alayhi salam, had passed menopause. And she was in old age herself. And Allah gave her Ishaq. And after Ishaq, a grandson, Yaqub. And after Yaqub, Yusuf, alayhi salam. So this is a great... Uh, hope for all of us that he was only in his 20s 70 years or so later Allah accepted his dua 70 or so years later Allah gave him what he asked look at ourselves now sometimes we ask for dua and we want it immediately and if Allah doesn't give us to it immediately we start getting agitated 
And then we hold on to false signs. It must be this. It must be that. We get anxious. Don't get anxious. Know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a reason why it's not coming to you right now. And have trust. And this is what the meaning of tawakkul is. And that is why when I talked about istikhara the other day, some people, uh, they objected. Because they, they can't fathom the fact that an istikhara doesn't necessarily have to have a dream. Doesn't necessarily have to have a particular sign that comes down to you in some form of magical or some kind of uh, divine characteristic. It's a dua. And the outcome, inshallah, will be good. And it will drive you away from what is bad to you. Just put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You may get a feeling, you may see a dream, you may see signs. But not necessarily, it can misguide you. So it's tawakkul. Put your trust in Allah that the outcome will be good, inshallah. And keep going and keep going and keep going. And keep asking and seeking advice and so on. That's how Ibrahim salam was. Ya Rabb, give me a son. Seven years later, he gets a son. Ismail. And he says, Alhamdulillah, who gave me while I was an old age a son. He didn't sit there saying, my Lord didn't even respond a long time ago. I could have, you know, you know, like some people say, I could have had him early and played footy with him. No, he gave him to me. He didn't say, he gave me to him as an old age. What am I going to do with a son in old age? I can't even walk. No. Ibrahim Salam said, Alhamdulillah, who gave me in old age, my dear son. And that's how a Muslim is, is thankful and grateful. Had he given him to him earlier, Allahu Alam wouldn't work out. And then Ibrahim salam sees a dream. The dream is that he saw that his son, he's slaughtering his son, that he gave him in old age. You see, look, brothers and sisters, Allah is teaching us. After 70 years or so, Allah gives him a son, which he has always been longing for as a father. And when Allah gives him his son, his son grows up. Allah says, فَلَمَّا بَلَغَ مَعَهُ السَّعِي when, Ibrahim, when Ismail came to an age where he's able to help his dad and walk with his dad, when his dad really needs him. In old age, he's frail. He needs someone to help him. The people have abandoned him and Allah gives him a son in the end. And that son, as soon as he gets to an age where he's strong enough to help his dad, Allah gives him a dream that is slaughtering his son. You know, you've got to get rid of him. And Allah is not telling him, I'm going to get rid of him. I'm going to make you slaughter him. You're, I'm going, you're going to get rid of him. That's what Ibrahim Salam understood. Do you, do you see the test and the trial, brothers and sisters? And now compare us with things that happen around us. How is our mindset? What do we think about it? This is a lesson for us to look at the patience of Ibrahim Salam and the lesson. What does it mean? Patience means have hope. Hold yourself together. Things will happen, inshallah. If a door closes, another one opens. Wallahi azim Just try it. And brothers and sisters, Ibrahim salam sees a dream. So he goes to his son Ismail and he says, Ya bunay, inni ara fil manami anni adbahuk. Oh, my dear son. The word Arabic here, the Arabic word here used is Ya bunay, meaning my dear beloved son. He's, <laughs> he's, he's feeling the pain. I have seen it. I, I see in my dream that I am slaughtering you. What do you think? Why did Ibrahim Asam ask his son, what do you think? Because he wants to share the good deeds in him. And he wants to test this son which Allah had given him as a righteous son, if he truly is righteous. Not because he doubts Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but again, there is a difference between believing and when something is made apparent to you. It's just a different experience altogether. So he says, What do you think, son? And also he's teaching him. Ibrahim uh, Ismail says to him, Ya abati, O oh my dear father, if'al ma tu'mar, do exactly as you have been commanded. Satajiduni insha'Allahu min as sabirin. You will find me, insha'Allah, among the patient ones. So Ibrahim salam knew that Ismail salam knew that the dreams of the prophets are from Allah. But realize Allah did not say that, he did not say that Ibrahim Islam saw himself that he had slaughtered his son. He was slaughtering his son. So Allah didn't want him to really slaughter him. But the action of slaughtering, because it's something else. Allah would not tell you to kill your children. And he will not take them away from you just like that to punish you. There has to be a wisdom behind it. Ismail alayhi salam was taken by his father. And Allah says in the Quran, فَلَمَّا تَلَّهُ لِلْجَبِينَ And when he placed his son on his forehead. Do you know why it says on his forehead, brothers and sisters? 
Because Ibrahim السلام, did not want to see his son's face while he's slaughtering him in case the compassion of the father hits him very hard and then he will not be able to carry out Allah's order. And Ismail was on his jabin. As he did that, Allah says in the Quran, so the verse goes like this. فَلَمَّا بَلَغَ مَعَهُ السَّعِيَ قَالَ يَا بُنَيَّ إِنِّي أَرَى فِي الْمَنَامِ أَنِّي أَذْبَحُكَ فَانْظُرْ مَاذَا تَرَى قَالَ يَا أَبَتِ افْعَلْ مَا تُؤْمَرْ Satajidunish قَدْ صَدَّقْتَ الرُّؤِيَا إِنَّا كَذَلِكَ نَجْزِ الْمُحْسِنِينَ When he reached an age when he was able to help his own father, he said, Oh my dear son, I see in my dream that I am slaughtering you. What do you think? His father immediately responded, Oh father, do exactly as you have been commanded. You will find me God's willing, God willing among the patient ones. When both surrendered to Allah's command and Abraham flung the sun down on his forehead, we cried out, O oh Ibrahim, O oh Ibrahim, you have indeed fulfilled your dream. Thus do we reward the good doers. He fulfilled the dream. He didn't want him to slaughter his son. He wanted him to learn and to teach us and for us to have a story of what true obedience and submission to Allah and reliance upon his command really means. Allah tells us commands in the Qur'an. He prohibits us in the Qur'an. He guides us in the Qur'an through His prophets. Who of us take Allah's commands and His prohibitions with peacefulness and serenity inside our hearts? Or do we question, why did God forbid this? Is it bad or very bad? How bad is it? I know it may make me enter hellfire, but will I get out eventually? Maybe. Oh, good. That's a relief, they say. I know this is haram, but, you know, I'll still go to Jannah, right? Mm, Allahu A'lam. Well, every Muslim goes to Jannah. Yeah, oh good, then I'll go to hellfire for a bit. Why did Allah tell me to do this? Why do I have to? I think I don't have to pray, it's in my heart. Brothers and sisters, when Allah commands us something, do you take it really with submission or not? That's what Muslim means. That's why Allah says when they fully submitted. And He's telling us, He's not asking us to slaughter our children. Allah SWT is saying to you, pray, get up a little bit, slaughter your sleep a little bit, just a few minutes. <laughs> slaughter your passions, your, your desires a little bit, slaughter your egos a little bit, you know, humble yourself a little bit. But we say no. No! Anyway, a lot of us say yes, inshaAllah. Allah SWT brought a big ram from Jannah. And Jibreel alayhi salam said to them, Allah has given you this as a compensation. Slaughter this ram as a fidya, as a compensation uh, for the slaughter of your son. We don't want you to slaughter it, but we wanted to bring out a beautiful lesson out of it for all the Muslims and your children to come and all the generations to come. And everybody will do this qurbani, this uthiyah. It means that every time they slaughter a sheep during Eid al-Adha, they give it out to the poor and the needy and they share it among their families to come together. Allah is the one who gave us the permission to slaughter his animals, which he had created. And he gave us conditions in how we slaughter them. We must put them to rest. We have to say Bismillah. We have to be humane to them. We have to slaughter them with a sharp knife from jugular vein to jugular vein. After you've rested the animal and you say Bismillah in the name of God. And you have to swiftly slaughter the animal. Why do you slaughter the animal? Because studies have shown that it is the most humane way to slaughter an animal from jugular vein to jugular vein. And not cut the uh, central medulla, which is at the back. The central medulla is responsible for all the sensory receptors in your body that makes you move, the motor receptors. And when you cut from jugular vein to jugular vein, these are the biggest veins in the body, 
or, and what happens is that the blood gushes out. You don't cut the back of the neck because it, it's, it, it triggers, stimulates the adrenaline rush from your pancreas and other places in order to bring out the toxins from, the different, from, from your pancreas and uh, filtering out the liver and for the blood to gush out because the biggest carrier of diseases is the blood. So all of this system is mechanisms all meet a few things. Number one, the way you slaughter the animal makes the animal lose consciousness as quick as possible. Because when the blood rushes out and gushes out like that, immediately the animal loses consciousness in their brain from the lack of oxygen. Number two, it comes out very quick. So that all of it can be drained. The adrenaline makes all the toxins come out so that it can be halal for you and good for you and healthier for you. We know, I know we see the animal doing all these things and we feel mercy towards and Allah loves mercy. But that actually is the most humane and merciful way. The Prophet ﷺ said, don't even slaughter a sheep in front of another sheep. They said, Ya Rasulullah, if we're slaughtering them both, what's the point? So what if we slaughter a sheep in front of another sheep? He said, why would you kill that sheep twice? The sheep is looking at his friend dying and, and animals have feelings. So don't anyone say that Muslims are inhumane in this time of Qurban. You give it out to the poor, the needy. We slaughter them in a humane way and it's once a year. And the, and the majority of people of the world live in poverty, my dear brothers and sisters. Who looks after them? Some people never have meat even once in their, once a year they get it, subhanAllah. So human life is important too and Allah has given us this permission. The Uthiyah, whoever makes the Uthiyah, inshaAllah, gets a tremendous reward. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings that sheep on the day of judgment to bear witness for you as a beautiful ram. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lets animals bear witness for you in goodness. Lastly, brothers and sisters, the story goes on, and I know that you're tired now. Ibrahim alayhi salam and Ismail were ordered to build the Kaaba. And the story, all, you all know it, alhamdulillah. They built it brick by brick, and there was a little stone which Ibrahim alayhi salam stood on. It's a, it, it, there's nothing special about the stone. You'll find many of these stones around these days. They're quite a soft type of uh, material. We all know it. It's made from uh, soft material. So nobody thinks that this is a special stone that God brought with Jibril or anything. And we don't worship this stone. He just stood on it. And uh, there's stories about the stone gliding up and down as Ibrahim was standing on it. This is not true. It was just a stone he stood on just to sort of put himself in a level where he can look at the Kaaba and make sure that it's level. And as they were building it, uh, Ismail alayhi salam was helping his father. While they were doing it, they're making dua. Rabbana taqabbal minna. Rabbana taqabbal minna. Oh, our Lord, accept our worship from us. Accept our worship from us. Brothers and sisters, listen. This is to tell us. Ibrahim and Ismail, the best of, one of the best of creations, are saying, Oh, our Lord, accept it from us. Why? Are they insincere? No, they are not insincere. They are absolutely sincere. But this is the sign of humbleness. How do you know that you are a true worshipper of Allah? How do you know you are sincere? One of the best signs is when you do your good act, but you are never 100% sure that Allah will accept it. So you say, oh Allah, accept it. Taqabbal Allah. We are not, how do you know that you are arrogant or think that you are good, too good for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or insincere? You say, Pshh. I prayed Zuhur today, mate. I'm going to go to Jannah. See, today, gave a hundred dollars, pal. hundred bucks. I'm going to Jannah. Or I put it on social media, but that's going too far. Or some people, they think, I'm righteous. Look at my hijab, how beautiful it is. Look at my beard. Oh, I've got a better beard than yours. Mine's longer than yours. Look, I even grow it on the sides. Oh, you cut it from here. I don't even cut it from there. See how righteous I am? My, my thawb, I wear a thawb, man. I wear a thawb. This thawb is just the culture of the Arabs, my dear brothers and sisters, and some other cultures. Oh, I'm more religious than you. I go to the masjid more than you. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm the best. I'm going to Jannah. What are you doing, brother? What are you doing? You remember the story I told you about the guy who said to me outside, Dunya, Dunya. I had a nice car. He goes, you're following the Dunya, brother? I looked at him and I said, what, you, are you better, Yani? How do you know? I'm buying this because I wanted to get married. That's fi sabilillah. That's in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Dunya, dunya. We don't, we don't ridicule other people because we think we're more righteous. Ibrahim alayhi salam Ismail are building with the faith in Allah and saying, Rabbana taqabbal minna. Oh Allah, accept our deeds. You never know what happens in your future, brothers and sisters. So don't ever have tremendous, tremendous uh, a, a certainty that you are the best and don't have tremendous anxiety that Allah is going to put you in hellfire in between always make dua oh Allah accept oh Allah accept keep yourself humble keep yourself humble otherwise you'll become a show off and lose all your good deeds keep yourself humble
Someone praises you, say, I ask Allah to make me the way you assume of me. And when you go home, say, oh Allah, forgive me for the way they talk about me. Uh, oh Allah, do not hold me accountable for the way they talk about me. Forgive me, from the, forgive me the sins which they don't know about me. And make me, oh Allah, better than what they assume of me. That's the best dua. Keep yourself humble and good and your self-esteem high, inshaAllah, with these duas. Rabbana taqabbal minna. Oh Allah, accept from us. Keep your connection with Allah. Every salat, Rabbi taqabbal minni, oh Allah, accept it from me. Sadaqa, oh Allah, accept it from me. Keep yourself in tune like that. Tawada, man tawada alillahi rafah. Prophet said, whoever humbles themselves for the sake of Allah, Allah will lift them. That's how your self-esteem rises. By being humble and not boastful in between. Is that good? Uh -huh. Brothers and sisters, finally, Ibrahim A.S. and Ismail built the Kaaba and there was one rock left. One little corner that they couldn't fill. You all know the story. What happened? What happened? Huh? Uh, we're not, yeah, okay, Hajar and Ismail, yeah, okay, I didn't tell their story, but they brought a black rock. They brought a rock, and Jibreel A.S. had brought them this rock, they say. That's what the story says. Allahu A'lam, we don't know for sure. But there was a rock that was special. And Ibrahim A.S. and Ismail put it into that corner. It's called Al Hajar Al Aswad, the black rock. There are many stories about the black rock. There are some hadiths which are weak, some hadiths which have problems in them. We don't, and, and when I ask the scholars of hadith, they all say, look, we don't know for sure. Maybe this, the, this rock did come from the sky, or it came from Jannah, or maybe it was white and it turned black. But all the, these hadiths, they're not reliable. You might find a few hadiths on Islam Q&A or somewhere, and they say, Sahih. But really, the scholars of hadith, they speak in a different language. It's not completely reliable, but it's not completely deniable. However, what we know is that this rock has its specialty. And that the Prophet وسلم, in a Sahih hadith in Bukhari and Muslim, Umar ibn Khattab saw the black rock and he came up to it, touched it and kissed it. And he said in front of everybody, this is an authentic hadith, he said, I know that you are nothing but a rock. <laughs> Umar, you know how Umar is. Anh. I know that you are nothing but a rock. You do not benefit and you do not harm. لا تضر ولا تنفع. Just like Ibrahim alayhi salam. ولكن but because my beloved sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, kissed you, I kissed you to follow in his sunnah. That's it. So we emulate the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa So it's special to the rock, but nothing more than that. So was it white and did it turn black because of the sins of the people, they say? This hadith is weak, actually, brothers and sisters. Uh, you can uh, look it up, inshallah. The Shaykh al-Adawi, who is a muhadith, Shaykh al-Luhaydan is a muhadith, Shaykh ibn uh, Shaykh um, al-Fawzan and others, they talk about this hadith. Shaykh al-Fawzan, he says, Allahu A'lam. I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. But what we know is that it is a special rock, but don't go overboard with it. Some people, they fight. Have you seen them in Hajj, how they go for it? In Umrah? <laughs> the rock <laughs> they want to kiss it you find them coming up they got injuries on their heads another person's fallen a sister's hijab has come off another man is going ah and they just want to get to the rock i saw once one guy flying he's flying and i said allah look at the iman but people were carrying him because he was in the way his uh, his top uh, uh, towel came off and i thought oh my god and the bottom one stayed on. I said, Allah, what iman. Even the bottom one stayed on with all these people. No, no, no. There's nothing special about that, brothers and sisters. Harming a Muslim to get to the rock is haram. And you lose your rewards. Some people think if you touch the rock, you're blessed for life. Like a hack. I don't have to pray anymore, mate. I've touched the rock. I'm the best. Did you touch the rock? I touched the rock. Say, Allah, let's get barakah from you. I saw once some people over there, sorry, I don't mean to be uh, teasing people. Some people may get offended. I'm really sorry about that. But I just want to make you laugh a little bit. It's not true. This is absurd. But there's nothing in the sunnah to say something special because people are harming. I went to Hajj and Umrah, go to Umrah Allah, and I always see people elbowing people, kicking people, headbutting people, slamming people. Mate, if you get a person trained in jiu-jitsu, you're finished. The rock is all yours, man. Go for it. <laughs> The rock, my dear brothers and sisters, if you can get to it and kiss it, you do it because of the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Otherwise, you just point to it and you keep going. Say, Bismillah, Allahu Akbar. That's it. End of story. Brothers and sisters, that's all it is. I once was there and this person, I saw him take off his ihram, the towel. You know, the two white towels that they wear in ihram. He was rubbing it on the Kaaba. 
And next he came up to the black rock, rubbed the, the towel on the black rock. So he was part of another group that I know of, and I said, well, why are you doing that? He said, Hala, I'll show you, I'll show you. So said, what are you going to show me? He goes, Hala, watch, watch, this, this, this towel is now different. So if you know the Jamarat, where we throw the stones, you know the story of the stones. Then the time of Ibrahim as they were going to build the Kaaba, the shaitan came up. And then they threw seven stones at him, then he came up again, they threw stones at him for about three or four days. So we go and do that as well. We throw the stones just out of rituality and copying our uh, Prophet Ibrahim. So then I saw him over there. He gets his towel. He makes it into a ball and throws it. <laughs> so why'd you do that? He goes, that is going to burn the shaitan. I go, why? Because I rubbed it on the Kaaba. He said, Habibi, first of all, there's no shaitan there. There's no shaitan. Because what do you mean? I'm throwing it. I said, that's the story of Ibrahim. The shaitan happened a long time ago, 5,000 years ago. We just do it out of love. And we worship Allah in different ways. Allah just made it. We don't understand the whole reason for it. But Allah said, do that and I'll reward you for it. All together, something to do that unites you. That's it. One person, he took his shoe off. You know how many shoes I see in there? Have you ever seen it? Anyone seen? Huh? So if you lose your ihram, just go there and you'll get one, inshallah. Wash it and wear it. Shoes, I bet you it has to be an Arab. Because that's what we do. Must be one of the mums. We are professional. We are professional. Yeah. I think we learned it from the Aboriginals. The boomerang. <laughs> so we throw it at them. And these are all not true, ya ikhwan. Another thing, brothers and sisters, is Ibrahim alayhi salam built the Kaaba and then he stood on a stone and called it Maqam Ibrahim. And one more story I just want to say, insha'Allah ta'ala, that Hajar, Hajar, long story of Hajar. Ibrahim alayhi salam said uh, Allah commanded him to take Hajar to the middle of the desert before the Kaaba was built. There was nothing there in Mecca. And she had her newborn Ismail son, he was still a baby, breastfed, being breastfed and just started to eat. So when he reached the, the, where Mecca is, Ibrahim salam got up and he left. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered him to leave them there, in the middle of nowhere. And when Hajar salam saw her husband get up and leave, she didn't know what was happening. He didn't explain to her. Why didn't he explain to her? In case she begs him, she talks to him, and he changes his mind, and his compassion and mercy kicks in. He said, I have to obey Allah. So he got up and started leaving back home without them. Hajar understood that he's leaving them there. So she raced up to him. Ya Ibrahim. In their language. Ya Ibrahim. Ila man Who are you leaving us to? Who are you leaving us to? There's nothing here, just vultures. And Ibrahim salam would not answer her. Ya Ibrahim. Ila man tatrukana. And he just wouldn't answer. She got more scared. He's not even answering. Finally, she just took a step back and just got herself together and said, Hmm. With her piety. Allahu Amaraka bihada. Was it Allah who commanded you to do this? And he just stopped and nodded his head and said, Naam. Yes. And he kept walking. And she said, Idan, layyudayyan Allah. Therefore, Allah will not lose us. Such piety and taqwa and trust in Allah. Did she wait for a sign to come down? Did she wait for a dream? No. She said, Allah will not lose us. Khalas. He commanded it. It means it has to be the right way. I don't need my husband anymore. I don't need anyone. I don't need food. Nothing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala left her there. And then she got up. And her son got hungry. The food ran out, the water ran out. We all know the story. She started running in between two little hills. One's called Safa, the other one's called Marwa. That's what we call it now. The Arabs later on called it. Her son was on the floor and she ran to Safa. Looked around, can't see anybody. Ran to Marwa, can't see anybody. Ran to Safa, can't be ran. So seven times. She started at Safa, finished at Marwa. And right in the middle, I want you to listen to this. Right in the middle, close to where her son was, there was like... This, this dip, a big dip, like a valley. As she walked, she has to go into the dip and come out. As she went into the dip, she couldn't see her son anymore because she was so low. So she ran it. She used to run it. So she'd walk, 
fast, and then when she got there, she'd run it. Why did she run it? Like what a mother does. She's afraid for her son. She wants to keep her eye on her son. So she ran it in case someone steals him or a, or a wolf takes him or something like that. I want you to remember that running position. When she reached Marwa, she heard a voice. And remember what I told you, when you're alone, you talk to yourself. She said to herself, Sah, Sah, Shh, Shh. <laughs> Human beings. So she went back, and when she reached uh, Ismail alayhi salam, she found gushing water coming out of the ground. It started to make a river, it started to make a big pool. So she started to grab clay and rocks and everything and close the circle, close the hole a little bit more and make it more restricted. And she said the words, Zummi, Zummi, Zummi. And that's why it's called Zamzam, meaning shrink, shrink. The Prophet Muhammad said, Rahim Allah, Ummana Hajar, may Allah have mercy on our mother Hajar. Had she not said Zummi, Zummi, it would have been large and wide, feeding all the Arabian peninsulas. But anyway, that is the will of Allah. Subhanahu wa Till today, the water is gushing. Nobody knows exactly where it comes from, probably comes from all the mountains. I'm sure all of you have done different research. All of you have something to say about it, I'm sure. Zamzam is a big thing, but it is a miracle from Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then we all know the story. The Arab tribe who had left Yemen, they, were, uh, they had a drought and all that, and they were looking for a new home. And they saw vultures around there, and they knew that there was water. They came to Hajar and they said, uh, can we share the water? She said, no. No. So, they said, why? They said, you're not going to share it. It's mine. They said, we'll pay you. We'll rent it off you, and we'll use half of it. She said, I agree. So she was a businesswoman. And this in Islam is allowed. It's not stingy. You need to survive. And in Islam you have the right to survive. It doesn't mean you are less religious. And she shared the water. And subhanAllah it was the will of Allah to show us how those people who started this journey, the Arabs who came from there, the real, Bedouin, the real Arabs from Yemen, who came there, they still had principles. They never harm a woman who is alone. She's alone with her child. They could have just killed her and taken the water. But they said, we never harm a woman. That is the tribe where Muhammad wasallam eventually was born out of. You understand? And Ismail wasallam grew up among them. And he married from among them. And they gave birth from among them. And then people who are... Then came Arabs who became what we call Arab Musta'raba. Meaning that we are not original Arabs, we became Arabs. So I'm one of those. That's why our color is a little bit lighter. But the, really, the real, real Arabs are very dark in color. You'd think that they're African, um, you know, that's, that's what they looked. That's the real Arabs of Yemen. And uh, what they did was, they lived, and this is how it happened by the will of Allah. Remember when I told you about the dip? So, listen to this. Today, nearly, today, every year, every day, Every minute, every minute, there are thousands of people walking between Safa and Marwa. And then they leave and another thousands come. Then they leave, another thousands come. Millions, billions for 4,000 years have been walking through Safa and Marwa. Men and women. And even when they reach, there's a point where the Dip was, now there's green lights that just put tiles. We have to jog it. But not the women, only the men have to jog it. What's the reason? Allahu A'lam. When we talk about equality in Islam, we talk about equality in religion, in spirituality, in good deeds. The roles are different. And here Allah says, men you run, women don't run. But it was a woman who ran. No, it doesn't matter, I want the men to run. It shows us that we are not here to compete between genders. We are here all to obey Allah. Allah is my Lord and her Lord. The man's Lord and the woman's Lord. We don't need to debate. We don't need to argue. Stop it. Stop it, brothers and sisters. Obey Allah and see what Allah says. And then come to agreement and have mercy between each other. We run it even though it was a woman. Women don't run it even though it was a woman. Billions of people walk between Safa and Marwa. Because of one woman. Because of one woman. Not because she's a woman. Because she was a righteous woman. And that's how Muslims judge things. 
We judge it based on righteousness. We don't judge people, we judge an action based on righteousness. Does it please Allah? That is our measure. My measure is not your, how you look or your money or your fame. My measure is righteousness. Because of one righteous woman who stood firmly in taqwa and trust, we still walk till today like her. We still make circumambulation like Ibrahim and Ismail. We still go there and honoring it as one whole family. Brothers and sisters, I finish it with this. What is hajj for? Hajj is to show us that Allah is one. That we are all servants of Allah. That we all came from Adam and Adam came from soil. That no one is better than another person except in piety. No color, no race, no gender. Nothing is better than another except in taqwa. To show us that we are one ummah, we are one nation. And the word ummah, community, means comes from the word mother. A mother encompasses. It's like we encompass one another. We are one ummah. When we go there, we know what is better than another person. We are brothers and sisters. What hurts you hurts me. I make dua for you. You make dua for me. To show us that your status and your humbleness is not in your material, but letting go of the material and earning the material, but in the piety of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in his last sermon in Hajj, لا فرق لعربي على أعجمي إلا بالتقوى There is no superiority of an Arab above a non-Arab except in piety. كلكم من آدم وآدم من تراب You are all from Adam and Adam was from the earth. And finally, I conclude with this ayah in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says يا أيها الناس إنا خلقناكم من ذكر وأنثى وجعلناكم وجعلناكم شعوبا وقبائل لتعارفوا إن أكرمكم عند الله أتقاكم إن الله عليم خبير. O people, we have created you from one male and one female and made you into many nations, tribes, and races so that you may come to know one another and identify each other. Indeed, the most honored among you to Allah is the one who is most God-fearing and righteous. Allah is all aware, all knowing. I thank you for listening and I ask Allah subhanahu wa to accept the hajj of our brothers and sisters who have gone to hajj this year and to accept your good deeds. And may Allah accept your deeds in these 10 days of the hijjah, accept your uthiyah, accept your worship, and may Allah subhanahu wa accept your dua. Wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.